he who finds a wife finds a good thing. That is Proverbs 18 and 22. Welcome to Trina Talk. This is the podcast where guests share their stories of pursuing their passions, living a fulfilled life, and empowering others. Each week, I talk with inspiring leaders, business owners, and people with amazing stories from around the world in unscripted conversations as they share their successes and failures. This podcast is all about empowering you to keep striving in your personal and professional life. And I am your host, Trina L. Martin. Hello, welcome to Trina Talk. This is episode 94. Before I get into this week's episode, for those of you who want to start a podcast or start live streaming for a limited time, I have a special pricing offer on my technology assessment. For one hour, you get to ask me any questions that you may have on starting your own podcast or live streaming show. To take advantage of this limited time offer, go to tech.trinalmartin.com. The topic of this week's episode is You Can Fix Your Relationship. My guest this week is Laura Doyle. Laura is a relationship and therapy expert who is on a mission to stamp out divorce. She is also a New York Times bestselling author. Her books include The Surrendered Wife and The Empowered Wife. Laura shows women the proven way to fix their relationship without their man's conscious effort, even if it seems completely hopeless. Laura has been married to the same man for over 30 years. Hi, Laura. Welcome to Trina Talk. Hi, Trina. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you know, I am so happy to have you here with me. And I think the topic that you're going to speak on today is something that everyone can benefit from, because I'm pretty sure it's um, a topic that we all have, you know, need help on. I know I'm divorced, so I need help too. Um, You are a marriage expert. So before we get into talking about that, tell us about you and how you ended up to be who you are today. Well, I I think I'll start from the spot where I was sitting uh, on the marriage counselor's gray couch when I first realized that my marriage was hopeless and that I was going to have to either get divorced or spend the rest of my life in a loveless marriage because uh, he was never going to change. We were just too far apart. We'd been in marriage counseling for years and he had been diagnosed with a common mental illness. I was diagnosed with depression and, you know, I just realized this is not going to work, but the only problem was I was too embarrassed to get divorced. People had been to the wedding, just not that many years prior to this. And I didn't want to have to, you know, return the presents and things like that. So Instead of getting divorced, my last ditch effort was to ask women who had been married for what seemed like an eternity, which was 15 years at the time. I thought, oh, they've been married for 15 years. Boy, they must really know something. And uh, I got, I asked them for their secrets to a happy marriage. And some of the things they told me did not even make sense, Trina. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute, I, what are you talking about? Like one woman said she tried never to criticize her husband no matter how much it seemed like he deserved it. And I said, huh, well, we got anything else, you know? (laughs) And then I I went around and most of it just made my head explode. Most of the things they said, I didn't even think I could do the things that they were saying. And um, so I thought, well, I'm just going to experiment with this stuff. I'm going to make my own marriage a little laboratory. And if it works, I'm going to keep it. If it doesn't, I'm going to throw it out. And so I'd been experimenting wall-to-wall hostility, or we would have these cold wars where there was no talking for days. And we also had a habit of having these big blowouts in the car. I remember we were in the car on the way to the happiest place on earth, 
when we were having this huge fight and that's when he said, fine, we'll go to marriage counseling, you know? So that's, that's how I let him have the last word on that one. But anyway, so at the time it was, it was really rough, but I started these experiments and not too long after that, I walked through the door and my husband's face lit up. He was happy to see me again. Mm-hmm. And that had been gone for a long time. And so I thought, wow, this is working. Something is, something's happening here. And it was really uh, an awakening for me. It was like I had this new pair of glasses and I could really see what I could do to make my marriage shiny and amazing, the kind of marriage you dream of when you say, I do. So I started, you know, really trying to get into these things. And then I noticed that I couldn't do them for very long. They weren't that hard. They were just new. They just felt uncomfortable and um, but a lot more dignified in most cases. But I couldn't, I couldn't keep doing them, you know, in order to keep my marriage shiny. I mean, I just remember, you know, things got better and then we'd have another blowout in the car. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is, here we are back to this. And I had hoped that that wasn't going to happen, but it did. So then I got this idea. I thought, well, if I had some more structure and if I had some more support and if I had other women to talk to about this, maybe I could, maybe I could be more successful. So I recruited for my girlfriends who also had troubles in their marriage. And we start, we started a little support group in my living room. And I just remember it was crazy. Me, I, I shared, you know, how I try this or do that. And they would come back with miracles. One woman, her husband won the sales contest at work, took her on the most romantic getaway of their lives. And that was, believe me, that was not happening for them prior to this. And another one just said, you know, my husband painted the family room. Uh, and, and we've been arguing about that for months. And then he just got up and said, you know, I'm going to paint the family room. And we're like, well, you know, what is happening here? So we knew we were on to something. And that's when uh, one of the women said, hey, can you write down what we're doing for my cousin in Florida? She wants to know what we're doing. I said, okay, sure. And that became uh, my first book, which is, uh, has a controversial title. It's called The Surrendered Wife. And uh, I know a lot of modern women, mm. I think even me, if someone had asked me, like, here, would you like to read The Surrendered Wife? I'd be like, no, I would not like to read The Surrendered Wife. I am a feminist. <laughs> you know, I didn't even change my name when I got married at, at first for a while. And, uh, but it was just a surprise hit. It became a New York Times bestseller. It was published in 19 languages in 30 countries. It sort of accidentally started a worldwide movement of women who practice the six intimacy skills that lead to having a playful, passionate relationship. So it's just been kind of a miracle and a blessing. And now I'm on a mission to end world divorce because I hate for any woman to suffer in her marriage like I did for so many years, just because she didn't get the right training. You know, maybe she didn't have a good role model. I I didn't. My parents are divorced. So I was following a failed recipe and wouldn't you know it? I got the same results as dear old mom. You know, I started to um, before the intimacy skills kind of swooped into my life and changed everything. Wow. That, that I mean, I have so many questions for you. So, <laughs> so did you get divorced or did that marriage end up working? No, I am, I am still married to the man that I thought was the huge loser pants with the mental disorder. And today, you know what? He is just my hero. He is my, my dream man, the man who wooed me, the one that I fell in love with returned when I started with these skills. And so I have now been married over 30 years myself. And, um, you know, I've, I've got, I've got a New York Times bestselling book. I've got a show on Amazon Prime. I've got a, 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 co- a coaching, international coaching company. And, I, I, you know, I have all these accomplishments. The thing I'm most proud of in the whole world is that I have a playful, passionate, peaceful relationship uh, with this wonderful man. Okay, so we definitely need to talk because maybe <laughs> you can help me for when <laughs> the right guy comes along for, with me, for me, because... Yeah. My ex, honestly, you know, yeah, that probably shouldn't have never happened, but I have two beautiful children as oh. a result. But it, I understand what you're saying about, you know, um, just it, not being there, things not working right, because I would tell him, you know, these are some things you need to do, or these are the things that would help us and make us happy. And of course, it would be okay for a week or so, and then we would go back to that. And I have a friend and we laugh about it now, but she says, 
you know, I remember when you were married and I would call you because I knew you were driving home from work and you would be taking the one on one (laughs) home. And that was like out of your way because you didn't want to go home. And I didn't. I did not want to go home. So help me <laughs> and help yeah. other, everyone else. Oh gosh. Yeah. How do we remember. do it right? <laughs> well, I was, you know, it's just a, a re- reminder for me how painful things were at my house too. I mean, you talk about not wanting to go home or right. Like just days of silence, like not, not silence. Like it's a silent retreat or something. It was like tense mm-hmm. silence and hurtful. Um, you know, just, seething resentment. Um, it is incredibly painful. It's like, yeah, no wonder I want it out. No wonder you want it out, right? It's very draining. It's exhausting to live like that every day. So I guess I just uh, I just have a lot of uh, compassion for women that find themselves in that situation because I remember being there and I had no idea how to get out. Like I was doing, you know, what the counselor said. And she said exactly what you just said, right? Like, you know, you need to communicate what your needs are, whatever. And you know what, that has been my actually now it's my my worst relationship advice of the week award winner, you know, for like, you know, 16 weeks running or something is trying to tell your husband, he, you know, for example, one of the things I used to do is he wasn't very affectionate, right? I He didn't even want to he didn't want to talk to me. He'd rather watch a rerun on TV <laughs> than make love to me. So I was like, oh, there's definitely something wrong with him because yeah. men like to have sex. And yeah. so he doesn't. So it must be him because, you know, can't be me. And um, I don't remember standing there with my hands on my hips and saying, you know, the average couple has sex two and a half times per week and we haven't done it in two weeks. So I think we should do it. And that just was not very attractive for some reason. <laughs> but, um, and it's interesting because like, you know, the idea that I would ask him to be affectionate, it's like, well, does he not know that I like affection or he just somehow forgot to be affectionate? It's like, every time I would ask, it was that much more painful because I didn't want him to just give me an obedient hug or kiss. I wanted him to want, I wanted him to just look at me and be like, mm, you know, like you, you are, you know, it's kind of like some of the things he does now. Like um, re- recently I was brushing counter uh, crumbs off the counter and he said, Oh, hold on. Don't move. And he got out his phone to take my picture. Like I'm the supermodel that he's been married to for 30 years, which I just, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to feel so desired and admired like that? Uh, and now I have that, but I never got there by asking him to be more affectionate or to spend more time with me or give me more attention. In fact, I I feel like, you know, he just would leave like rubber marks in the road, you know, (laughs) trying to get away when I did that. So, uh, and it's such a common thing that you hear everywhere. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of fun kind of poking, uh, making fun of conventional wisdom, right? I spend all that time in marriage counseling. I know what it is. Um, and it just never worked. And for a lot of my students, right, over 15,000 women who've now uh, fixed their marriages, they, they'll say the same thing. The counselor told me, you know, I should do this. And that never worked. So it's interesting that we have all these myths or, you know, I, I just feel like in some ways, the things that society tells us about how to fix marriages are lies. So they are. Yeah. I mean, yeah, right? I'm like you, I, I was a product of, you know, a single mother home. So I didn't have right. that example modeled for me. I knew what I wanted in my head. And as I look back now, I know my problem was settling for the wrong person. And that had been a, a repeat thing in my, in my relationships in general, but to give us a secret. Tell us about the sure. six intimacy skills that you talk about. Well, let's talk about especially this particular one, right? The whole thing where you're asking your husband, what kinds of things can I ask? That's getting kind of personal, but what kinds of things did you tell him? Like, I need you to do this, this and that. What kinds of things would you say to him? Um, oh my goodness. So many things. <laughs> um, so I you would say, general if you want. <laughs> okay, so let's just take this one. Um, Friday tra- is trash day. You need to put the trash can out on the street. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we've had this one millions of times, too. So it's really interesting, because I think I think one of the mythologies that um, so you're a successful career woman, too, you know, like, like I was, and what and that was a big part of our was that a big part of your training, too? Like, you got to grow up and get an education and a career and you can't, for God's sakes, don't depend on a man, right? Was that part of your training? Okay, so that's part of my training, too. 
And so what I learned was how to be successful at work. And at work, you're trying to improve the bottom line. You're trying to manage your staff. You're trying to get your projects done. Well, at home, the goals are very different, right? So I learned to be successful at work. At the home, I just wanted him to tell me I'm beautiful. I wanted to tell, you know, I wanted him to like stroke my hair. I wanted him to pull me in at the waist for a passionate kiss because he was passing me in the hallway. And those are totally different goals than at work, right? So what I did in my marriage that was a big mistake and um, really cost me a lot of intimacy was I tried to manage my husband like he was my employee or my subordinate. So I so I had a little graph. I had like a spreadsheet of the chores and they were divided very evenly. And do you know, they, that was not working for us <laughs> whatsoever. You're not surprised to hear that, are you, Trina? No. And, and they hear it, so men don't like to be managed. Nobody really wants to be managed, let's face it, like in a, in a personal relationship, right? But especially men, we all want to have our sense of autonomy. And men, uh, one of the most important things to them is to feel respected. So me saying, don't forget to take out the trash. It just, I sounded like his mother. Men are not sexually attracted to his, their mothers. And, and this is really common. We see it's like, it sort of sets up this whole uh, rebellion where he's like digging in his heels and he is not going to do the thing that he feels managed to do. And then you get so frustrated because of course you need help. It's logical to say, you know, would you take out the trash? And now you've got a battle over something so simple and it's very hurtful and you don't know why it's happening. And again, it's like your single mom and my divorced mom, right? They didn't, they didn't have a good uh, system for this either. So one of the things that um, I was really um, amazed to find was this um, expressing my desires in a way that inspires. So, and this is about triggering my husband's hero gene. And so it's a very specific phrase that I use. And I'll tell you what I how I was doing it before. So I was a very overworked kitchen elf, let's just say, back in the old days. I had to do all the housework because he wasn't doing it. I had to manage everything because he wasn't doing it right. And um, so I would say to him, he'd be sitting on the couch watching TV, and I would say, this kitchen is a disaster area. And Trina, you know what I thought he was going to do? I thought he was going to jump off the couch and start cleaning the kitchen. But you know what? That didn't happen. That right. never happened. And so, um, and I think probably, you know, he didn't even know what I wanted exactly because I didn't say what I wanted. All I did was complain. All I said was, you know, John, you know, he probably heard John, blah, 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 because they can't even hear us when we're complaining. But so then finally one day I, I learned to say it uh, in the, the form of a desire. So I said, um, I would love a clean kitchen. And he goes, oh, you would? Okay, I'm going to, I'll clean it then. That was like 20 years ago. He's been doing the dishes ever since because he knows it makes me happy. So I'll break that down. I'll break down the structure of expressing your desires in a way that inspires if you want, because that is like the magic ticket to getting, you know, any man pretty much mm -hmm. to, to um, respond to the things that you want instead of the things that you don't want. And so instead of complaining, you can always flip your complaint into a desire and express that. So do you want me to uh, break down the, the format? Yes, yes. Formula? Okay. I I'm learning. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I use this everywhere. I use it with, you know, a sales clerk. I just use it everywhere. So the format is this. Here's the formula. It starts out, I, you could say I would like, or I like to say I would love because love attracts love. So I say I would love, and then it's a final outcome. So I am not going to describe how, because once you get into the how, again, you're kind of like managing, right? You're sort of micromanaging, nitpicking. So for example, I remember one um, student, she said, well, I would love for him to make more money. And I, and money is a means to an end. It's not really the final outcome yet. Right. So I said, well, let's dig down a little bit more. You know, what would you have if he made more money? She said, well, then I could buy myself things. And I said, well, what kinds of things would you be able to buy? And she said, well, I need new boots. And I said, all right, now, now we're on to something. So the, her, her desire would be, I would love new boots. Mm -hmm. That's it. It was, it's not about how much money he makes. She just wants new boots and we don't have to control how that happens. But men get super inspired when they hear uh, what we want. Like I remember another student, she was just, she was reading one of my books. She was sitting on the couch reading one of my books and she decided she, she read the formula. She got all excited. She said, I'm going to try this. And so her husband was walking by and she said, I would love a glass of wine. And he goes, oh, oh, I don't think we have any wine. She goes, 
I know. I was just wanting one. So no expectation, no demands, no complaining. And so she just went back to reading the book. And next thing she knows, he's coming down the stairs with his shoes and his keys and their son. And uh, and, and the son is saying, can I go with you? And she goes, where are you guys going? He goes, I'm going to the store to get you some wine. So that's how powerful expressing your desires is. Wow. Okay. So I have to play devil's advocate. Oh, you kid. do. Absolutely. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> because the man I was married to, believe me, I've tried. It it, it wouldn't work. Okay. So oh, yeah. yeah. It got to I the point, that. you know, with the, you know, empty the trash. It's Friday. It's five o'clock. You know, that type of thing. But before it got there, I had tried several, several different things. And it was just... It, it was like it was going over his head. Like you said, it, it was like Charlie Brown's, you know, teacher. Rah, 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 rah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was going, my goodness, what does it take for this man to pay attention and know what's going on? And we even went to therapy, you know, before we separated. And one of the, the comments he made to the therapist was, well, my mother is my priority. My mother and my sister. Yeah. And. Yeah. And the therapist looked at him and went, really? And I'm going, yeah. <sighs> yeah, painful. Jeez. Because then you think, how is this ever going to improve, right? Exactly. Yeah. So let me just, I just want to say, like, for me, you know, I, I, I just think it, it wasn't meant to be, right? You're divorced because mm-hmm. that just wasn't, that wasn't meant to be. And um, so, you know, the you know, the new guy that you're going to bring into your life and, um, you know, have a a playful, passionate relationship, um, you know, would, would, you know, benefit from this kind of thing. But I just know for me, it was a really big eye opener when I found out what respect looked like to men. Like even now I'll be writing a blog about like, this is what men think of when they think of respect. My feminine brain will be like, what? That is so weird. That's not, that's not how I think at all. It's so opposite. And I know it sounds kind of old fashioned and sexist, but you know, for me, I just like whatever works. Right. So one thing that was interesting is I thought that I was helping my husband when I was making suggestions or he would say, I was thinking about doing this and I would kind of play devil's advocate, you know, just kind of challenge him and have him, you know, you know, did you think about this perspective or whatever for them, for, for men, for my husband, for the husbands of thousands of students, I've been, you know, had the honor of watching them in their relationships. And that appears as disrespect. Helpful in wife language is critical in husband mm-hmm. language mm-hmm. and they become defensive and then they feel, they feel disrespected and they just kind of roll up the drawbridge and then, you know, peek over the edge and you get answers like, well, my mother's my priority because they're, they're feeling so, um, they feel, you know, there's a big, strong man and yet he's feeling insecure, right? He's not feeling, um, yeah, he's not, he's not, he's not confident. And I saw this with my husband where he just, I remember when I very first learned the intimacy skills and started treating him with a lot more respect because I had, I didn't know that that was, I wasn't being respectful, but I finally started bringing the respect. And I remember one of my friends said, uh, John looks different. He looks uh, taller. You know, what, what's <laughs> happening? And it's like, I feel like he did stand taller when he felt like the woman who knew him best in the world. He would look into his wife mirror and see reflected back to him like, ah, you're pretty smart. You're pretty capable instead of, oh my God, what a loser pants you are. Right. Which was, um, you know, that was my perspective before, before the skills. So it really was like a, a self-improvement journey that I went on to become, um, my, my best Laura, a better Laura so that I could have my best relationship. Uh, but learning how to be a respectful wife. I mean, that doesn't even sound exciting, right? Does that, who wants that? Nobody really wants to learn how to be a respectful wife. It sounds uh, I think people think of obedience or subservience or submission or something. And that's not it for me at all. It was just more about not losing my dignity by um, criticizing a lot of things that came out of his mouth. And I totally get that. And I totally see that. Um, I'm almost 50 now. And I I do see what you're saying. And just as you learned, I learned along the way that some of the bad things that I had picked up from my single mother were some of the things that I was bringing into the relationship. But my ex aside, because I still think that's just, he's just a totally different animal. But 
from what I hear you saying and from what I have experienced since then is men want to be the, the providers and the protectors and the nurturers. And you just have to kind of, like you said, surrender. You have to kind of surrender it to them. Not that you're weak or that you're laying down and letting him walk over you, but letting him know that he has that place with you. Absolutely. You said that really well, Trina, because I always think like a surrendered wife, well, surrendering is something we all have to do every day, whether you want to or not, right? You might be stuck in traffic. I don't know if you have traffic in Houston. We sure have it in Los Angeles. <laughs> so so uh, you might wish the traffic would move, but you can't make it move. But you might say, well, I'm going to listen to an audio book, or I'm going to talk to a friend, or I'm going to listen to music I love. Like that's making the best of what you've got. And a surrendered wife knows that she can't change anyone besides herself. So she doesn't try. She doesn't tell her husband what to wear or how to drive or what to do at work. Instead, she focuses on her own happiness. And that in turn really improves the intimacy. Wow. Yeah, I get it. I, I mean, hopefully for the, you know, my Prince Charming, it's coming along. We'll have that, but I, I get it. It does. It really makes sense. So let's talk about yeah. your show. You say you have an Amazon Prime show. Yeah, I do. The It's called Empowered Wives, Empowered Wives. And that's also the name of my latest book, The Empowered Wife. And uh, I have a podcast also, Empowered, Empowered Wife podcast. So, And that's because uh, surrendering, I did feel like made me empowered before when I was really suffering in my marriage and uh, I felt I had to be responsible for everything. I was kind of overworked and exhausted and lonely and I felt very victimized. I didn't know that I had the power all along like Dorothy by clicking my, my red heels that I could create the kind of culture where I feel desired. I feel special. I feel taken care of in my marriage every single day now. And so, uh, yeah. So the empowered wife was really the exact right title. Wow. Now I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So you did all of this improving. I won't say changing, improving in your marriage, which helped your marriage. Has your husband ever said that he did some things within himself to help as well? Well, what, it, what he's done, said and what I've definitely witnessed is that as I changed, he had to, he had to respond to me. He responded to me so much better that it felt like he was making all the changes that I'd been asking him to make, even though I wasn't right. I was using like influence instead of control. And then I got a much better response. But what, like one of the things I'll notice is I'll be so like, Oh, he should apologize. Like, Oh, he was wrong. I want to, I want an apology and I would like it on a silver platter right now, you know? And as soon as I got willing you know, and humble enough and accountable enough to just say, well, okay, he's 99% wrong, but there's this 1% over here and I could, maybe I could apologize. You know, that wasn't exactly my best self. So maybe I could apologize for that 1%. So I'd apologize for that 1% thing. And then two things would happen. First of all, he would immediately also apologize for his part. And the second thing that would happen was I no longer needed it. It no longer seemed like life or death that I get an apology because something about cleaning up my side of the street um, removed that pressure for me, just kind of, kind of made it go away and maybe see the world a little bit differently. So, uh, so I have a little formula. We have a little formula actually uh, for that as well, especially knowing that respect is so important to my husband and to all husbands everywhere that I've ever met so far. Um, I have a little uh, formula that we use and, and I think most women hear it and they, they want to throw up. Oh my God, that's awful. I would never say that. And yet, uh, once I, you know, someone, someone once said that it feels like sawdust in my mouth to say that. <laughs> and then she said, after she used it, she goes, it feels like honey in my mouth now. Do share. So, so the phrase is, I apologize for being disrespectful. Oh, I apologize for being disrespectful. And then you cite the specific Thing. So I had one, we were at dinner not too long ago, way after I knew better. So, you know, just so you know, I'm not perfect at these skills yet after 20 years of practicing. If I get perfect, I will send a postcard out and let everybody know that that has happened. But we're at dinner and he was talking about it as one of his clients for work. And I said something about the client, a little disparaging about the client, critical about the client. And we were at this nice restaurant, the music's playing and everybody's talking. 
And I swear, as soon as I said that, it was like the music stopped, boom, you know, the record, and, you know, everybody was quiet. And then he got this look on his face and I thought, oh, oh, I, I wonder if that was disrespectful. And I wasn't willing to be accountable yet. So I just said, that. I go, I go, you know, I could just see he was very unhappy. And I just said, uh, oh, was that disrespectful? And he goes, Yeah. And then I used my little magical phrase. I said, oh, I apologize for being disrespectful when I criticized your client, which was, he rightly took that as me telling him how to run his business. Mm. I don't need to do, right? He's competent. He's capable. He wants to be seen that way. And I do see him that way. But, you know, I had that little lapse. So anyway, as soon as I said that, like the music comes back on, <laughs> everybody starts talking, the party's back, and we're having this nice dinner again. So I just find it to be, such a quick way to restore the intimacy that it's worth it to me. I, I have to admit, you know, I, I don't really want to be, I don't want to hear those critical things coming out of my mouth. I don't want to sound like a shrew. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy being around myself when I was nagging, controlling, complaining. Uh, I had a rage problem, big rage problem. I was a rage at my husband. I'd rage at hapless sales clerks and practicing the intimacy skills has really freed me of that. You know, I don't, I no longer worry about showing up on a Karen video. Thank goodness. I, I think I might have though in the old days, you know, I think I might have if they'd had cell phones when I was still um, raging my rage. What is, that's good. Please don't show up as Karen. Yeah, no, no, please. No, that's not good. No, no, but I, yeah, sadly, uh, I think if there'd been videos of me, you know, that time with the bank teller or that time with the, yeah, entitled entitled and full of rage. You know, and that's, you know, it's funny that you say that because I'm just reflecting on myself and I'm sort of like you, I've gotten to the place where I guess I'm in a happy place, even though I'm not in a relationship, but yeah. I deal with people differently as well. Like I'll go into places, you mentioned the bank, just say the bank, for example, and I'm more smile. Hi, how are you doing? You know, whereas before I was just like, this is what I need, blah, 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 and get out. And that really makes a difference. I have seen how people respond to me. Like I'm very intentional about when I call someone or I'm going to have a service, I always say, oh, well, thank you. I appreciate your help for that. Like I'm on a, a service yeah. call and you can tell the person was not expecting that. Yes. So I'll say, you know what, you know, they'll, you know, they do the script of, okay, is there anything else I can help you with? And I go, oh no, but I really appreciate your help. That was so helpful for me. And they'll go, oh have a nice day. Yeah. It, so it's, it is, it's amazing how you can change how people feel just by, like you said, what, you, what you're saying to them and how you're saying it. Yeah. I love that you do that, Trina, because I do think almost everybody you meet is starving for acknowledgement, especially those service people, right? They don't, they don't get it. And, um, that was another piece that I was really missing in my marriage too. Like, let's go back to the trash, right? My, my husband religiously, and he didn't, we had the same issue with the trash that you had with your ex and, uh, but not anymore. He, I never even think about the trash cause he, I, he's on it. Like I know he's taking care of it. It's, he's proud that he does that for his family, which is just me actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, and I used to think, well, I don't want to thank him for that because he might decide it's optional first of all then he'd stop doing it and it's just one more thing I'd have to think about right so I didn't and I also thought well nobody's thanking me for well you know I do a lot around here nobody's acknowledging me so I don't want to do it and it was so interesting it was such a eye-opener to see that um, you know it's part of one of the skills is is acknowledging uh, I acknowledge my husband at least three times a day for uh, for whatever something he did, you know, he, he makes my tea every morning. So I'll, I'll thank him for that or thank him for working hard to support the family or, uh, you know, I'll thank him for doing the dishes, for example. And um, and that's just really created actually a culture of gratitude in our house where he now acknowledges me all the time. And also it really like he has got inspired like, oh, that you like that? That makes you happy. What else can I do to make you happy. I remember one student, we had a man panel, we had a uh, cherish for life uh, weekend, like an event. And we had a man panel and one of my students' husbands was up there and he was saying that he fixed a broken cabinet for his wife. And she was so overjoyed at that. He'd made her so happy. He said to himself, what else can I break around here so I can fix that too? <laughs> 
Wow. I mean, it it seems so simple what we're talking about, but it's amazing how many people don't do it and don't approach it that way. And my question is, with your clients and in your coaching, do you find that people like myself, who's, you know, professional, I've I was established before getting married. Do you find that we are the type of people that have problems with this? <laughs> <laughs> you think, right? No, <laughs> no I mean, I, yeah, it's, uh, I was really, I have about, I have 45 coaches that work in my organization now. And I was amazed to realize recently they almost all have master's degrees. <laughs> I did not know that. I don't have a master's degree, but they do. MBAs and they're highly educated, accomplished uh, career women. We have, have doctors, lawyers, uh, certainly teachers, and uh, you know all all different professions. And uh, I do, I do think there's, uh, you know, it's not that easy to change your hat when the working day is done, right? If you're used to running a show. And you come home and you think, well, I know how to run this show. You know, I, I, you know, I have these projects and I manage them or whatever. It's, um, it's such a different thing to uh, show up uh, with my feminine hat on, I call it. Right. And so what does that even look like? I think I thought I was like a smaller, less hairy man. You know, I wanted to succeed at work. So that's what you got to do. You just got to be a smaller, less hairy man. And um, boy, I'm finding out that is not true at all. Uh, in fact, more than ever, I use um, what I call the feminine gifts in my work life than, than I ever did before. And that is amazingly powerful too. I feel like women can move mountains without moving a muscle uh, by, by just using our unique gifts, which I didn't think were important. You know, it was almost like, uh, seemed like weakness to me. So now, you know, I, I think about how important they are in my relationship. I think about how important they are in the world, right? If, if being a woman was not a value, I think we would all be men, right? But it is a value to be a woman. And so what does it mean to be feminine? What does it mean to, you know, what are those powers, right? That was a big area of study and further amazement for me. And, you know, a couple of things that I've discovered are, one is uh, receptivity. Receptivity is the essence of femininity, right? You think about our bodies are kind of a metaphor for this. We are built to receive. Mm -hmm. And when I think about how, what a bad receiver I was early on in my marriage, you know, my husband would get me a gift. He'd get me flowers and I would be like, oh yeah, you know, I don't think we should waste money on those. Or he'd get me a present and I would return it. I had a, one student uh, talking about this, actually, this very thing where she, her husband, for their first Christmas together, he got her a beautiful, sleek purse but it was like a, a clutch. It was like a little clutch. So it's not your everyday, you know, put all your tissues kind of purse. It was, you know, you could probably fit, you know, your phone and your one credit card or something. That's it. So she said, Oh, wow. It's just, it's beautiful. I love it. And then she took it back to the store for a oh. refund. <laughs> yeah, she did. And, uh, and then later on, she learned about receiving. And uh, so she said to him, I, I really apologize for taking that back to the store. And he goes, Oh, Thank you. You know, I'm so relieved. And she goes, well, what do you mean you're relieved? He goes, well, you said you loved it. And then you took it back. And I just thought, how am I ever going to make her happy? How will I oh. ever delight my wife? So the next holiday that came up was uh, her birthday and he got her a sweater. And then it wasn't her kind of sweater. It was just, you know, it wasn't her style. It wasn't her color, whatever. So, but she kind of had learned her lesson. She's like, this time I, I just really want to stretch, you know, broaden my horizons a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to, keep this sweater. And so she did and she wore it uh, a couple of times and she got quite a few compliments when she was wearing it. And do you know, it became her favorite sweater. So <laughs> he had seen something about her. Right. And I know for me, it's like, I think, you know, with a lot of the presents I got and that I just returned, it's like, well, I should have, I should have just married myself or something. Cause I wanted right. what, you know, or just, you know, if you want the perfect present, you just, you, you go to the mall and you buy it, right? That's what, <laughs> presents are something else. It's an interaction that you're having where you're a little bit vulnerable because you don't get to control what that person gets for you, but you get to, you do, you can receive it graciously by looking past the item even, and just looking at, wow, they, they thought about you, what you would like, what would delight you, and they they made the effort to to bring that to you, uh, and that's that's very loving. Wow. Yes, I, I I 
have learned that. And it's funny because I'm that woman that I don't need a man. I can come in, you know, I can change a light bulb. I can even change the oil in the car and all of this other stuff. And, and I always wondered when I was in my twenties and thirties, I was wondering, I was like, how did these bimbo girls get all of these good men? <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm smart. Hey, I'm strong. That's right. How do these women get? And now I, it just occurred to me as we're talking how they do it. They probably just smile and say, thank you so much. Yes. You're so, you're so strong. You're so, and you know what? Isn't that true? I mean, thank you so much. You are so strong. And this is so nice of you to do that for me. So this is, none of this for me is about putting anything on. It's all about becoming ever more authentic but also choosing from among my, I'll call them my real thoughts, right? My, mm-hmm. my, my higher thoughts, my better self, not so much, you know, my mother on her worst day thoughts. Right, right. Which yeah. fly through my brain too, right? Exactly. Yeah, but it, I mean, it just, it dawned on me because I was going, how, how does this happen? Because you find men that say, oh, you know, I want a smart woman. I don't want a gold digger. But then you look and you go, well, that's not who you're with. But if they're the woman who's going, oh, I can't change a light bulb. Can you help me? And then he does it and they go, oh, my God. Oh, that was the best light bulb changing I've ever had. <laughs> That's, you know, <laughs> if they're grateful. Right. And and it's I mean, it's interesting because like so you and I are very capable. Right. And and a lot of women very, very capable. We, of course, we can change a light bulb ourselves. <laughs> But it's interesting, you know, I think then the mantras we grew up with, right? Like I can do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. But you know what? I can't do everything. And I am a mere mortal woman with limits. And I don't really want to kill this fairy spiders myself. And I don't really want to get up on a ladder and change that light bulb. And I am really grateful that I have, I I don't have to do it. I don't like, I don't want to hold the trash out to the curb every week either. I don't want either. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. I don't want to to do it. it. It's so nice. To have. So it's not about weakness for me anymore. It's, it is about, sometimes it's about vulnerability. Uh, like uh, last night I just said, oh, I just can't make dinner. And we're still quarantining here. We've got, you know, big COVID cases. So, so every meal is made in this place called the kitchen where you have to gather your own <laughs> ingredients and cook them yourself, you know, unless I was just like, I can't make dinner. And he's like, okay. He goes, you want me to make it? And I go, yeah, that'd be great. So we did. He made and served dinner and cleaned up afterwards. So, I mean, could I make dinner? I guess so. But you know what? I was going to be a ragged mess. <laughs> I was at my limit already. So, and I, and today I recognize that before I get to be, um, you know, Godzilla going through the town, like, you know, causing, you know, wrecking things with her rage. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We could stay on this forever, but (laughs) I have 10 questions that I ask of all my guests Mm -hmm. and they're the same questions. So yes. So I'm going to start with those. So number one, who or what motivates you? I am very passionate about my mission to end world divorce and every hurting woman that I meet who's suffering in her relationship is uh, just a reminder of what my life was like and how much I suffered. And I can't stand it. So I, yeah, not on my watch. (laughs) She can't, she can't continue to suffer without at least being introduced to these concepts that uh, I was so lucky to learn from happily married women. Yeah. And you know what, before we go on with the questions, let's talk more about that because your mission and how are you doing so far? I mean, your clients and just tell me about that whole process and you deciding that, you know what, this is my mission. I have found something that works and I want to make sure I spread it to every other woman. Yeah. Well, I think it was just incredibly gratifying right from the beginning to have found something that was so effective for me in my marriage and then to be able to share it with other women and have them go, you know, OMG, this is really life changing and eye opening. And, uh, you know, I, I remember when the surrender wife first came out, I got, I had put my phone number, and my email address in the book. Cause I thought, you know, maybe some women would want to reach out about this. Well, there was an avalanche. There were thousands and thousands of women who reached out and said things like, I, you know, I, I, I love these concepts and I'm, and I'm trying to do that. And I, I need more support. I need more help. 
And I, there was a time when I was just so overwhelmed that I just thought, you know what? I wrote the book. It's out, you know, you, anyone can read the book and you're, you know, you're all good. And it was really just about being afraid to um, show up for my purpose in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, I kind of put my feet on my desk and said, oh, I'm done. My work's done. And, um, and that was actually really uncomfortable because, uh, yeah, I, I, there's nothing more gratifying than uh, having a woman uh, have that aha moment. Like, oh, my gosh, I, I have this power I didn't realize. And, and now, uh, you know, almost every day, I, I mean, every day I get an email or a text or a something you know, that uh, she's been able to save her marriage because of the information or the coaching or, you know, because of the book or whatever that, that she got. Uh, so anyway, I, I just, yeah, it's my purpose in the world and I love it. I'm, I feel grateful to get to have this mission. I love hearing that because I'm also feel that I'm doing my purpose, but I love it when people say, this is what I love to do and I'm helping other people. And this is my purpose because we all have a purpose. It's just yeah. finding what it is. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting because my purpose only emerged after I stopped controlling my husband. It was almost like I was the armchair critic of his life as a way to avoid my life. Mm -hmm. and once I got back onto, I call it my paper, you know, Laura's, Laura's paper, I got to write a best-selling book. I got to have a coaching company. I got to go on national television and, and speak in front of live audience. Very scary things that I was too afraid to do wow. before that. Now, how many women have you actually heard or have they responded to you and say, you know what? You have really helped me. I didn't get divorced. Over 15,000. And wow. I've been saying that for 15,000 was the tally a few years ago. So probably more. Wow. <laughs> Way more wow. than that. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. yeah, it's fun. So in your coaching, do you have people that come from all over the world to you? How does, how does that work? I do. I do. I have a coach in India. I have, yeah, I have them everywhere. Um, yeah. Malaysia. We Yeah. So it's a, it's really a worldwide movement. Um, and that's been kind of, uh, that's been really exciting, really gratifying also that, you know, I, I remember getting letters from people in Egypt and they would say like, we thought only Egyptian men were like this or letters from a woman in Japan talking about how, how much better her family life was going, you know, since she got the skills and it, it's just been interesting to you feel like we all married the same man. You know, we all want them to take the trash out and they, none of them would from the way we were approaching it. Right. From until we learned um, a better way. And then it was like magic. And then it was like, you know, he, he was jumping up and volunteering to do it with a smile um, by, by taking a different approach. Yeah. Wow. Well, men, I hope you hear that because I have learned my lesson. So I will be a different Trina going forward. <laughs> I am different. Right, right. Yeah, no, and no, and to be fair, I just feel like if no one ever showed you, where were you supposed to learn that? Because was there relationships 101 at your school? Because there wasn't at mine. It wasn't at mine. If 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 no. there were, it must have been in some secret closet because I didn't uh, know about it. Right. So and it's like not everyone's gonna use calculus, but we are all gonna have relationships. I just feel like that is so much more important. So that's it a big part is. of why I want to do what I do too, because it wasn't taught. Yeah, it wasn't taught. And yeah, when you don't have it modeled for you, and you know, it, we all kind of assume, at least I did, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, I, I want that. I want the the husband, the kids, the white picket fence. Yeah, but yeah. if no one ever showed me how to do that, how no. was I supposed to do it? I don't know. I, I always think of it like, imagine if we said to kids like, oh, you know, you're old enough to drive now. So here's the car keys. <laughs> like, go ahead. Just take the car for a spin, you know, what do you think would happen? They would like crash the car and they'd say, wow, this is really dangerous. And they wouldn't even want to drive again, maybe. Right. Because we didn't show them. No, we make them take a written test. We make them, you know, learn in theory. And then we make them take driving lessons and then a driving test. And then we give them a license. The marriage, we just go, oh, that's great. You're in love. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh <my> <laughs> so right? true. So, yeah. So it needs to be a lot, lot, lot more education. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, oh we, yeah, we could go on forever, but let me, yeah. let me continue on because I'm going to continue talking to you and people are going to be like, well, let's hurry up. <laughs> so well, hurry up, Trina, hurry up. Number two, what demotivates you? Um, what demotivates me? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, you know, like just like not enough sleep. Usually it's my, you know, if my self care has gotten whack, if I'm, yeah, if I'm just working too hard or I just haven't had a nap or something. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'll get a malaise just like any mere mortal woman. (laughs) When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, but it worked out for your good? Uh, to hurt me. Oh, so interesting. I think that immediately goes through a filter that I have now that I think I've kind of developed from practicing these intimacy skills, which is that nobody was ever trying to hurt me. They were only, um, protecting themselves, right? They were only, um, yeah, trying to protect their own ego or survival or whatever it was. They only felt threatened. Um, so when I think about somebody trying to hurt me that I get stuck right there. Like, I don't know that anyone's ever tried to, you know, said something to, to hurt me. Um, <laughs> I mean, can I phone a friend on that one? Um, <laughs> we'll go on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Um, what is your fear? Um, I, uh, let's see. Well, I, I, you know, I get, I feel nervous every single time I do a new presentation, a new talk, a new uh, show, a new um, a new class. I teach, uh, I train coaches, right? So we just started coach training last week, and sure enough, on Tuesday morning, right before my class started at nine o'clock, I was nervous. And uh, you know, it's uh, yeah. So I know that I'm afraid of uh, disappointing or. Yeah, not being enough. This, mm. Yeah, just a human woman. Yeah, we all have that. Yeah. Is, is there a time when you wish you had done something that you didn't? <laughs> so many times. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I think I, I, I certainly had, it was just a very memorable, palpable regret that I had when, so I'd been married, you know, we were in marriage counseling for years, six, seven, eight, you know, nine, I think. And, um, and that's when I started interviewing the married women. And once I got my, had my experience where I got my new perspectacles and saw the incredible damage I'd done in my own marriage, how I had just ruined it by my own hands. Uh, I just, had tremendous regret. And even though it's just like we just said, nobody, I didn't know any better. I did better once I knew better, but um, I just felt tremendous conviction for all the harm I'd inflicted on the man I profess to love. Mm. Okay. So is there a time that you wish you had not done something? Um, You know, I sort of feel like the, I'm going to say no on that one, (laughs) even though I have lots of most embarrassing moments, but I sort of feel like all the, all the pieces of, you know, like the smashed up pieces of my life, the broken glass, I, you know, I just consider that like the materials for my beautiful stained glass window. That's unique to me. Oh, that's beautiful. What is your definition of success? Um. It's, it's living your purpose. Yeah, it's, it's being in flow, right? Having that sense of ease and uh, excitement and uh, challenge. And I'm just smiling just thinking about this, really, because uh, it's just, yeah, it's a sweet place to live. Mm. Now, I know you mentioned sleep. Is there any other way that you recharge? <laughs> yes, it's playing beach volleyball, which I'm Ooh. very passionate about. That is apparently the meaning of life is to play as much beach volleyball as you can. <laughs> and so I do love it. Wow. What are you awesome at? Um, not beach volleyball, unfortunately. Um, oh, you know what? I, uh, 
I I have a wonderful voice. People really love listening to my voice and they find it uh, nurturing and comforting and uh, interesting. And so I, uh, yeah, I feel, uh, yeah, accomplished about, even though I say um a lot, but I do, I feel like an accomplished um, talker. Your voice is soothing. Do you read your own books? Do you do audio books and read yeah. your own books? Yeah, I've read read all my own audio books. Yes. Yeah, I just did that with my books. Interesting. Yeah. What yeah. legacy do you want to leave? I want to end world divorce. And I want to, I also want to, uh, I'm very passionate about training my coaches now um, because that is the way to leave the legacy. That, you know, have women who are highly trained in the six intimacy skills and our unique coaching methodology is the way that this can live beyond me. And so that maybe, maybe we do have relationships one-on-one in schools. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's what I want to leave behind. Wow. Give the listeners one motivational takeaway. Hmm. Um, okay. I will. I, I, so the best conversationalists are good listeners. This is how you become fascinating to absolutely everyone you meet is by being a good listener. And there's this one three word phrase that I've found is just magical for making me a better listener, just helping me to really focus on what the other person is saying instead of just thinking about what I want to say back and also having them feel deeply heard, which we all need to be heard and understood. So I want to share that three word phrase and invite you to experiment with using it. And that phrase is, I hear you. That's it. I hear you. Not, I hear you. And what I think is, or I hear you and I disagree, or I hear you, but have you thought of? No, it's just, I hear you. And that's it. So you're not agreeing. You're not disagreeing. You're just bearing witness. Hmm. Wow. That's profound. Wow. So tell the listeners how they can connect with you, um, your coaching program, your TV show, your book. Give us, give us it all. All right. Well, actually, I'm only going to give you one thing because it's really fun. Okay. <laughs> and that is the Adored Wife Roadmap. And it's free. And you can get that at my website, which is lauradoyle.org. Uh, as soon as you go there, you'll see the Adored wi- road, Wife Roadmap right there. You just download it. It's a, a PDF. And it also includes a, the three most common mistakes women make trying to get their husband's time and attention. So I invite you to come in and partake in that. Wow. This has been so amazing. Like I said, I could have gone on to continue to talk to you because it's so relatable. Everything you're saying is I've experienced it and I'm pretty sure so many other people have. And when you break it down like you have, you're like, yeah, okay, I've done that, been there, done that. Yeah, now I see what I did wrong. So this was this was fabulous. Thank you so much. Yeah, it is. It's one of the things I love about being on my campus with all the other women where we're just swapping embarrassing stories all the time, but it sure feels connecting and it sure feels like a a club where you want to belong (laughs) with authentic women. And uh, I had the same experience talking to you, Trina. So thank you so much for your authenticity. If you like Trina Talk, please don't forget to go out to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. Also, who else in your life do you know that needs some motivation and inspiration in their life? Don't forget to share Trina Talk with them. I hope you have a great week. And remember, if you change your mindset, you can change your life. Keep striving because success is a journey, not a destination.